Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the most difficult things to deal with in life is suffering. Emotional suffering and physical suffering. And you don't have to spend a whole lot of time in this life to know that this life holds a fair amount of both. The physical suffering that comes as we face illnesses and diseases and even death. The emotional suffering that comes from hurt feelings and broken hearts and ended relationships and broken dreams. Suffering is a reality that we face in this life, and it's difficult to face, not just on its surface, but conceptually. Why do we suffer? It's a very difficult question to answer, and one that all of the world's religions try to wrestle with. We who are Christians have been taught in God's Word that suffering exists because sin exists. That God created a world beautiful and perfect and without suffering, and yet humankind rejected his instructions and his care, and therefore sin entered the world, and so did suffering and even death. That's the answer to why it exists, but it still doesn't seem to dig deep enough to really calm our hearts. But what if God promised to use suffering for good? Now, that would be a little bit different proposal, because when we suffer in this life, if we feel that that suffering is accomplishing something, that's a, that puts a totally different look on things. We suffer when we sit in the dentist chair, but we go because we know it's accomplishing something. It is helping us to be healthy. We suffer when we diet or exercise, but we do so because we know it's accomplishing something. It's enabling us to live healthy lives, and so on and so forth. When the suffering serves a purpose, it becomes a lot easier to face. And so we come to today's topic, as the author to the Hebrews writes about it, discipline. If we look at suffering in this life, not as a pointless exercise, but as the discipline that we as Christians face, then all of a sudden suffering has purpose. Suffering has Point. And suffering is guided by someone that we can trust. This is the time of the church here to talk about those things that are practical to everyday life. This season of Pentecost, when Christ has already come, he's already poured out his spirit upon his church, and now we use the color green to show the growth of the church in Christ through his spirit. And so we've looked at some very practical topics over the last few weeks. We looked at prayer. We, looked, we talked about money and giving for two weeks in a row. Talk about suffering. We talked about perseverance last week. And now we talk about discipline. And the author to the Hebrews gives us this wonderful assurance that in Christ there is no such thing as pointless suffering. Instead, we may view it as discipline, and that discipline always has a purpose always brings an outcome and is always guided by one whom we love and trust. The author to the Hebrews starts out in verse 4, and feel free to follow along with the passage on the back of your bulletin if you wish, by pointing out to his audience there that in your struggle against sin you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. At the time that this was written, there were those Christians who were having to shed blood because of their testimony, because of their faith. And that remains true even now. In the headlines, most of the, the headlines that we've seen lately about Christian suffering are happening, of course, in Egypt, as our brothers and sisters in the Coptic church are facing suffering and death because of their confession of faith. But this remains true in many places around the world. There are those who are resisting to the point of shedding blood, and the author to the Hebrews makes it plain, we are not among them. We may think it's difficult to live a Christian life in this day and age, and that is true. But we've not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. The author to the Hebrews makes it plain there's actually more suffering out there than what we currently face. Most of us would not receive that particular item as good news. But the author immediately then turns to this topic of discipline. And it points out, this author to the Hebrews, and I keep saying that because we don't know exactly 
of the, the letter to the Hebrews. He never, never signed it. We don't know who the author was. But the author to the Hebrews writes, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And you know, I always try to point out, when there's not really a gender point being made, I have no problem with saying sons and daughters, but here there is a gender point. We understand from those days how much uh, the son inherited, and that's the point that's being made here, the inheritance that sons receive. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. The author here is making it clear. Discipline has a purpose. It's not pointless suffering. There is a point. It serves a purpose. And that purpose is described in verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Well, yeah, because it is painful rather than pleasant. That's the nature of discipline. For the moment, it seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Have you ever spoken with someone who went through an excessive trial in their lives? I imagine you all have. I know all of you well enough to know that some of you have faced excessive trials in your own lives. And you know what's amazing to me? Maybe not immediately, but say 10 years out, 20 years out, the refrain that I hear from people is, it was awful, I'd never wish it on anybody, but you know what? There were blessings in it. I'm not sorry that I went through that. Because of the way that I grew. Because of the way that God revealed himself in that process. You talk to those who are cancer survivors, or those who have had to grieve, or all of those things. And people tend to look back on those experiences, just like using last year, last week's image, you know, the one who runs the race. We look back on the training and the pain even with a certain fondness, because we realize the good that it brought. That's the point that the author to the Hebrews is making. Suffering is not pointless. Instead, view it as discipline, and discipline has a purpose. And that purpose is to create disciples. Discipline creates disciples, which we all long to be and strive to be, disciples who serve our Lord. In the verses in between, 5 to 7 and 11 is used the image of our earthly fathers who discipline us. Now this is always a little bit of a PR risk when the authors use our earthly fathers as examples because I'm well aware that not every earthly father is perfect. In fact, no earthly father is perfect. Some of us are blessed with great earthly fathers, some of us less great earthly fathers. But we all have an image of what a true and good father ought to do and be. And that image isn't just somebody who says, you know what, go, go do whatever you want. I don't really care. No. A true and good earthly father takes great care in the lives of his children. Wants to be involved. Wants to help provide wisdom and shape and protection. And from time to time, that means providing discipline. Whether it's the discipline that prevents his children from running out into the street or reaching a hand right into the fire. Or the discipline that requires schoolwork and cleaning and shots. Discipline is part of raising a child. But discipline has a purpose. Discipline produces disciples. And that's not the only purpose that discipline serves. While suffering may seem pointless, discipline has a purpose in creating disciples. Discipline also, as these verses tell us, has an outcome. It's not pointless. It produces something. And that's where the author to the Hebrews continues with verse 7. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. In other words, discipline has an outcome. That discipline ought to produce a life within which obedience is a little bit easier. We're not going to be perfect. We're still bound here on earth within our sinful bodies and temptations. But discipline produces a little bit straighter path. So those bumps and bruises that we've already endured would not become crippling. But instead, we can, as last week's passage said, run with endurance the race that is set before us. And he describes what the outcome of discipline is. That we strive for peace 
with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, and that no one is sexually immoral or unholy. And then uses the example of Esau, who traded something that would have lasted his whole life for one single meal that was gone in just minutes and all the way through his system in just hours. He traded something lasting and worthwhile for something so very temporary. Discipline helps to prevent that sort of bad decision making. Helps to create people who are people of peace and holiness and grace. Discipline is not pointless, it creates disciples. And discipline has an outcome, which is a life of a disciple's testimony to the goodness of God the Father that we have received through Christ. While well, suffering can easily seem pointless and seem like it produces nothing, discipline has a purpose to create disciples. And discipline has an outcome, which is the testimony of a disciple's life. But all of that, if it depended on our own strength, as we well know, would come to naught. We cannot discipline ourselves as we would wish. It's why we begin every service by starting with an acknowledgement of our own sin and failings. If we could discipline ourselves, then eventually we wouldn't have to do that. Eventually we could save ourselves just a couple minutes of the service by skipping the confession and absolution and going directly into the, well, we'd have, we could skip the Kyrie too because God wouldn't have to show mercy. We could make it quite a bit shorter on Sunday mornings. Except, we all know full well that we continue to sin. We continue to fall to temptation. We're assaulted by this world and by the devil and by our own sinful flesh so that sin and failing is part of our own lives. And our own discipline would never come to perfection if it depended on ourselves. The outcome would never truly produce a disciple, never truly produce the testimony of a disciple's life. So thanks be to God, that the author to the Hebrews points out that discipline has a redeemer. Discipline has one who directs it, who guides it, who strengthens us during its course and assures its certain outcome. He does this by comparing the worship of the Old Testament. When the people came to Mount Zion and there were flames that burst forth and the sound of a trumpet and they were so afraid, they asked Moses to go up instead of them. They wanted someone else to be a mediator, to receive God's word. And that's what the temple system was. From that point forward, the prophets and the priests served as mediators so that people would not be destroyed by God's holiness. But then Christ came. And you want to talk about suffering. You want to talk about discipline. Christ, who was God himself, infinite and all-powerful, set that aside and became a human in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. God himself, in the flesh, assaulted by all the temptations and hardships of this world, and yet, he remained sinless. He took his sinless life all the way to the cross, where he bore our sin on our behalf, and was even forsaken by God the Father, and condemned for our sake. You talk about suffering, he faced it. You talk about discipline that has an outcome. And he is the perfect example and the perfect source because on that cross he conquered our sin, buried it with him in the tomb, and then rose again victorious and our sin did not rise with him so that he can offer to us through baptism, through confession and absolution, through his supper and through his word, the certainty of new life. Discipline is not pointless because it creates disciples. It's not pointless because it creates the living testimony of our disciple life. But mostly it's not pointless because discipline has a redeemer, Christ himself, who by his suffering and death has re redeemed all suffering and death. There are those within the Christian life who would imply or flat out say that if you become a Christian you will face no more hardship. That if you become a Christian, God will pour out blessings upon you. Your life will be one of peace, happiness, and plenty for the rest of your life. I think every single one of us could raise our hands in testimony against that particular teaching. Even for those of us who are Christians, maybe especially for Christians, we still face hardship and suffering. But no longer 
is that suffering pointless? Because our discipline has a redeemer. Christ, who has redeemed by his suffering and death all suffering and death for those who call upon his name. So in this life, we will face suffering. But for those of us who are alive by faith in Christ, that suffering may serve as discipline. And discipline creates disciples. So it's true that in Christ there is no such thing as pointless suffering. But instead, we know that God, who began this good work in us, will be faithful to complete it on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may your faith in your Lord Jesus Christ be strengthened this day by this word, that all suffering can serve for us as discipline, which produces disciples to the glory of God and by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the peace that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly in this faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.